Um, let me begin um, by uh, let me just begin by trying to frame my overall approach um, to some of this stuff. Um, there's a very real danger that the the framing of the overall approach will be more intellectually complex than the, what I'm actually doing. Um, I have an increasing suspicion of the way in which we do reception criticism, um, and this is one way of me trying to explore some of that. In brief, my concern is that we are in the discipline reinventing the 19th century gentleman collector, that the biblical receptionist identifies himself as a traveller and curator by turns who goes out into the far-flung margins of culture in order to collect and protect specimens, which we then line up in a neat catalogue, radical Bible, liberal Bible, um, and so on, until the history of the West has become a kind of cabinet of curiosities. I, in fact, would sort of, in some ways, would even disagree with the way James is framing some of his comments about um, uh, particular modes of biblical engagement, and would say that perhaps one way of thinking of it would be to think that we are still in a very early mode we're just very close to it and see lots of difference when in fact we might be in something much bigger. I would go with something probably more akin to a Walter Benjamin sort of approach to say that capitalism actually remythologized society in hidden ways, contra Weber, and um, therefore the, the, the Bible, and particularly the kind of simplistic Bible that I've heard about even in the short time I've been in the room, um, sort of David Tolleton's reference to this highly simplistic Bible, Joe Carruthers talking about this, about simplicity of biblical text. One way in which we could deal with that is by thinking about mythology and thinking about Roland Barthes's sense of myths as a kind of speech. And some of this comes out of that. What I'm actually going to be talking about in terms of content is, uh, so uh, before I go, so you'll see me slide around a little bit and I'm going to try and make sense of some of that sliding at the end. Does that sound all right? Great. He's shrugging because he's thinking it's not going to change what you're going to do. <laughs> As a party, we have always been defined by our internationalism. We believe we have a res responsibility one to another. We never have and we never should walk by on the other side of the road. And we are here faced by fascists. They hold our values in contempt. They hold our belief in tolerance and decency in contempt. They hold our democracy in contempt. We must now confront this evil. It is now time for us to do our bit in Syria. And so, to thunderous applause, did Hilary Benn, then Shadow Foreign Secretary, usher the British Parliament towards the vote that took Britain into the Syrian conflict in 2015. 397 eyes to 223 no's. So I'm interested here in Ben's curious use of the Good Samaritan trope um, at the conclusion of his message. Now naturally, see if this works, um, this is not an especially uh, new I think I've lost a slide. It's not necessarily an especially new uh, way of dealing with things there we go. Um, because as James, uh, uh, among others, have pointed out, Fort Margaret Thatcher used the trope of the Good Samaritan to talk about privatisation. The Good Samaritan was good because he outsourced his care. And Cameron uses the Good Samaritan um, as a sort of sense of state monopoly on violence. It's very small. Maybe not a big one. You cannot just walk on by if we're going to keep this country safe, he says. They are not Muslims, they are monsters, the embodiment of evil. And so, for James, certainly, um, that becomes a part of a bigger Cameron rhetoric about the state having um, the only legitimate monopoly on violence. So how does Ben's Good Samaritan, this sense of not walking by on the other side of the road, so we must bomb Syria, um, fit into that? And how does it sort of... How does his Samaritan work as a kind of mythological figure in the Barthesian sense? For Barthes, myth is a type of speech, a way of structuring a message so as to encourage a certain kind of consumption of that message. Complex images and ideas are turned into simple symbols that come together to make a language of their own. So everything sort of regresses back to signify a stage and you start again. This language turns the complexities of history and reality into atomic, self-evident, essentialised concepts that belie their own artifice. And you can hear what I'm saying about some of that touching on some of the comments we've already had. 
Now, I'm not the first to notice the mythological or biblical nature of Hilary Benn's rhetoric. Here he is. I won't play it. Um, Comedian and commentator David Mitchell noted the same strange twists in his column for The Observer the Sunday following the speech. He says, Hilary Benn has quite a robust interpretation of the parable of the Good Samaritan, says David Mitchell. In his version, the Samaritan doesn't just help out the traveller who's been mugged, he volunteers to seek out and blow the living crap out of the poor chap's assailants, despite the obvious practical difficulties of knowing who they are or of tracking them down. Mitchell adds to this the stark but perceptive observation that this is the Good Samaritan as played by Charles Bronson. Or perhaps better, by Harrison Ford, for as Mitchell goes on, Alan Johnson, says Mitchell, said there was, quote, a real and present danger. And after the Commons debate had gone the government's way, Philip Hammond, like an ageing and kindly gunslinger, declared, Britain is safer tonight. It's like they're jostling to make sound bites worthy of the trailer for a Jack Ryan movie. End quote. Now, attempting to extract a modicum of narrative reason from Ben's allusion to the Good Samaritan, trying to go beyond the cinematic rhetoric, one is still left with a curious vigilante Samaritan. This Bronson Samaritan embarks on a mission to strike out against a trouble spot with the functional power of the state. The parable's famous appeals to human engagement with others are entirely sidetracked. And it's telling indeed that by the end of Ben's paragraph in the speech, the relevant suffering has ceased to be anyone's but our own. Our values, our belief, our democracy is held in contempt. This is not a Samaritan engaged in authentic neighbourly action, but one interested in systemic adjustments as a response to particularised problems. Now, one writer who understands these dynamics especially well is Paul Ricoeur. And in History and Truth, Ricoeur devotes some considerable attention to the philosophical implications of the Good Samaritan story in the essay, The Socius and the Neighbour. And in The Socius and the Neighbour, the Socius is sort of the, um, the grand bureaucratic uh, systematic functions of human life. And the neighbour is, um, is a, an attitude in the first person. And his starting point is this, that Jesus is asked a question, who is my neighbour? And that the parable is therefore the only answer we have to that question, which is for Ricoeur a sociological one. So his is an inquiry into the neighbour as a social object, a closed category that can be defined and explained, which he wishes to overturn, um, in order to um, demonstrate that the neighbour is, quote, not an object, but a behaviour in the first person. One does not have a neighbour, says Ricoeur, I make myself someone's neighbour, knowingly, I think, deploying the first person in the process. So it's important for Ricoeur's purposes that the two individuals in the parable, who do not stop for the injured traveller, the priest and the Levite, are defined only as social categories. They're functions of a system who are absorbed by their role and therefore unavailable for an authentic individual neighbourly encounter. The Samaritan, by contrast, occupies a position outside of that, and unencumbered by that kind of social structural responsibility, um, his position outside the socius gives him a level of availability that's not open to the functionaries of the system. And it's this freedom from the socius that allows him to act in a neighbourly way. Now this throws into stark relief the fact that there will always be inherent ideological tensions when we use the Good Samaritan in politics, especially when a story about an authentic encounter is utilised as a systemic strategy by parts of the state apparatus. For, of course, when Hilary Benn mentions the parable, of the, mentions the parable comma, the shadow foreign secretary is speaking from as deep within the socius as it's possible to be. An elected government official speaking to parliament and a national political party about geopolitics. He's advocating the use of the structures of the state military to intervene in the interactions of foreign powers. Thus, his appeal to the great story of authentic individual encounter is curious, predicated as its telling is, on the functional and systemic dimensions of society. Ben's allusion to and self-identification with the Good Samaritan serves to dress up a vast multi-leveled socius in the dress of a neighbourly encounter. As a party, we have always been defined by our internationalism, he intones, locating the system of the party within the functional architecture of the international community. We believe, he goes on, we have a responsibility one to another, 
and so individually felt responsibility between people becomes a social system's responsibility to itself. In this way, the socius in which Ben participates becomes disguised as neighbourliness, stacked on neighbourliness. And bureaucracy, uh, the distances presupposed by a bureaucracy, are exchanged for the proximity presumed of a human encounter. Thus, Ben here is not... There, there is absolutely no overlap between the neighbour and the socius, but a colonisation of the one by the other. The socius is the man of history, rights recur. The neighbour is the man of regret, dreams and myths. And I think what we see in Ben's appropriation of the biblical text is precisely the person of history eating the person of myth. Ben has clothed the socius, the system, in the guise of the neighbour for the sake of marketing it. Now, that's all very well, and that's as far as a reading like that would go, except that when the missiles were launched, this is why I'm sliding a little bit, when the missiles were launched... The missiles we launched were British-made brimstone missiles. So if you will indulge me, let me just fall down the rabbit hole of the curiously biblically named brimstone missile that was launched as a result of the Good Samaritan standing at the dispatch box in Parliament. We might even have a picture, if I've been clever. There we are. The brimstone, I'll try and do my best sales pitch here. The Brimstone is a UK-made and sold 1.8-metre, 49-kilogram, rocket-propelled, radar-guided, supersonic, low-flying weapon. It is also a carefully packaged and distributed commodity that competes in a global marketplace. As the BBC recently reported, with telling terminology, the Brimstone is sold as, quote, the most accurate precision, precision strike product on the market. Such a phrase points to the way in which the brimstone sits at a confluence of cultural forces. In the brimstone, the sobriety of military strategy and the candour of the marketeer would appear to have met the rhetorical force of the biblical. The Bible is doing the marketing work on the weapon's behalf and is part of the bridge between the object's nature as a machine and its status as a product. The names of these missiles matter. And in particular, the language attached to the state's arsenal is cons always conspicuous in that it eschews the mundane reality of button pressing, as if military strategists were very keen to stress that their personnel are not merely typists, which is, of course, actually what they are functionally. Instead, the state military is painted in a range of fantastical colours and placed at the heart of a highly mythologised order. Most often, it's zoological forces that are deployed. Military personnel launch tomcats, vipers, hornets, wasps, phoenixes, bloodhounds, these are all real, tauruses, penguins and condors, seek bats and hound dogs and pythons. These names naturalise our conflicts, of course, or else transport them onto the battlegrounds of Narnia. Not content with mastery over the animal kingdom, other officials might make use of colonised vassal states, summoning Apaches, tomahawks, Spartans. Or still grander, they take up the powers of the augur and the prophet to conjure up a quasi-divine panoply. Genies, Hades, Poseidon, Satan, Perseus, Nike. So let's not pretend, therefore, that the mythic categories of deity, apocalypse and heathen are not powerfully at work in the rhetoric of modern warfare. Nor let us imagine that the advent of the brimstone brand brought into service in 2005 did not, to some degree, reference the religious tenor of the conflicts in the Middle East in which it was created to participate. And in fact, the other thing to say there is that um, not long after that, US military procurement had the choice to um, leave Lockheed Martin. And, or, uh, you know, so they've got, they were there with Lockheed Martin and they could have gone over to Brimstone. And so they faced a choice between decommissioning Hellfire missiles or buying Brimstone missiles. So the procurement officers literally had a choice between f raining fire or Brimstone down over the enemies. So, to my mind, the war games of the biblically named Brimstone shrink down an apocalypse, striving to return war to the innocence of the childhood game where pr pressing a button releases hellfire. If the chemical plastic toys that have often been derided for doing little more than preparing children for work, exchanging enjoyment for use, coins, tills, playing shop, playing school, then the theatrically named weapon balances up the equation from the adult side, 
For what else does the Trident missile do but transform the Prime Minister into a sea god, ruling over Britannia's proud waves as her proxy? The Tomcat missile does the same for the General, a child imagining his pets doing their bidding on the war front between the sofa and the dining room table. Declaring too much of my childhood here. So what do we make of the brimstone? Well, at the most obvious level, one can see why the, in the exhibition halls the name serves the marketer quite well. The missile recreates the user as a figurative divine in whose power rests not merely life and death, but the archetypal weapon of heavenly powers. The brimstone moves the missile's image away from being um, the mere animal kingdom red in tooth and claw, and even from Greek fire, and sets its user firmly within the theatre of a personally directed apocalypse, which issues from the cosmos's most legitimate being. It is the market's response to the kind of assumptions at work in Cameron's ideology of force that the state's is the only legitimate violence. Thank you, James. The brimstone creates an ethical hierarchy, therefore, between user and target. And it's in this context that the Good Samaritan's rather pro programmatic deployment in political debate can be better understood. If refusing to cross over to the other side of the road makes us de facto legitimate, and if the story can serve to mask the world of the socius with the mirage of the neighbour. It is because of a set of culturally pre-programmed responses to the story that work in precisely the same way as the names of missiles. The parable and the name both provide the state with roles in a story, turning them into, into responsible neighbourly deities. So like the art of Adorno's famous culture industry, this is a Bible that has been pre-digested or else fixed on a pre-arranged flight path. The Good Samaritan is a fire and forget parable. So this brings us back, I think, to Crossley's sense of the Good Samaritan of recent years as a category through which the state maintains an ideological monopoly on violence. The language serves to mask the way that the state naturalises its place within a global narrative. And indeed, um, one of the things in Cameron's quote is a differentiation between true Bible, true states and true Islam and fantastical opposition of monsters, the embodiment of evil. The brimstone fits seamlessly into that wider biblical mythoi and funds the same political impulse, that these mythical forces must be confronted with mythical weapons. Final part, quick. Iron Man. Let's bring all of this together in the figure of Iron Man. Now, I'm going to do this off the cuff in order to try and save time. How many, have people seen the first, the John Favreau, the first Iron Man film? Have people generally seen it? So, one, there are biblical allusions throughout. There's a whole render to Caesar unto Caesar, you know, render to render unto Caesar section at the very beginning, in which Stark has a conversation about how his arms deals enable him to go and help people in the third world. He's obviously read Thatcher's Bible. Um, Obadiah Stane, there's a whole press conference uh, where Jeff Bridges, the, e, the, you know, the, the baddie, talks about reading the book of Obadiah and then doing rewrites around Obadiah because of Obadiah Stane's name. But the main thing, of course, is the opening section of the film where Tony Stark is on his way to a um, sort of missile demonstration where he is launching the Jericho range of missiles and blows up a mountain. It is on the road from Jericho that he is set upon by thieves on the road and left by the side of the road without the people who are supporting him. And, and off he is taken to be, to, to be hostage. He's kept hostage with um, you know, a, 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 a non-American, non-white um, academic who's you know, clearly drawn in, in contradistinction to Stark, who, who ends up making a sacrifice uh, in order for Stark to become Iron Man. So there is both here in Iron Man this sense of the biblically named missile and the sense of the missile as a, a product. Stark Industries logo is Lockheed Martin's logo with an extra line drawn through it for the copyright lawyers. We might even have that. I might even have that somewhere. There it is. There's Lockheed Martin and there's Stark Industries. I, can't, I just I can't quite escape the similarity. And we have, again, this Good Samaritan parable playing out in the shadow of the Iron Lady's Bible with Iron Man. Now, of course, the difference with what happens with Iron Man, if you know the stories of Iron Man, he's a weapons developer who develops this suit. And so the story goes on 
to explore the question of whether the Iron Man suit should be used by the state's military, in Ricoeur's terms, part of the socius, or whether Iron Man's power is legitimate but because it allows an individual to make a meaningful intervention in global politics. This is emphasised in the film where, unlike the original comics, Tony Stark's true identity is known by everybody. So he conducts his war as a person and not as a social function, not as a hero. And this, in turn, would seem to reverse the approach to the Good Samaritan we found in Hilary Benton's common speech. Can you pass me a water? <clears throat> For if Ben's Good Samaritan <clears throat> is a socius crudely dressed up in the guise of a neighbour, Stark is a neighbour arraigned literally in the might of the military machine. Ben's speech references the Good Samaritan while cutting out the actual neighbourly content from that parable. <clears throat> And this feat is undertaken to extend the programmatised approach of the socius under the rhetorical cover of the authentic neighbourly encounter. Always the way. Stark, by contrast, <clears throat> represents the individual reborn out of the socius through intimate, authentic human encounter. He is the state in the guise of a neighbour. And he's clothed in the costume of the weapons programme. Now, I'd suggest that this is what Iron Man embodies as a cultural trope. He's not the golem wishing to return to the clay of an ancestral homeland. He's not the cyborg in which technological and human merge and coincide. He's not the Frankenstein of composite loves. He is the reversal of the classic political rhetoric of Benz that clothes mass effect in the language of individual response. He represents the maverick neighbour arraigned in the terrible functionality of the state. So... Why should Ben or we care about the comic book hero? <clears throat> First, it's no doubt telling that the connections between toys and military equipment we looked at earlier should be met by a comic book character mounting arguments against the moral frameworks of the arms trade. Second, we see in Ben's speech and in the culture of the brimstone's naming that the Bible appears to cosmologise war and using its mythic status imbues conflict with moral character. In this, the Bible functions as an integral part of a narrative system in modern democracy that seeks to direct violence as a means of dealing with the inevitable social disquiet that violence produces. The Bible mediates between our ideas of the West as a civilised society and our actions as a violent state. And it's, of course, significant that this cultural impulse is powerful enough to be reflected in filmic representations of conflict as much as in the literal wars themselves. Ben takes refuge under the latitude afforded by the image of the responsible neighbour, while the brimstone missiles attempt something similar to the de-escalation inherent to the toy box. Iron Man challenges the prevalence of that system itself, using the cover of comic book fiction to imagine the possibility of the individual that can bypass the state's authority, but not its military potential. So to circle back to collection, one need perhaps... You can see the slippage here between the dispatch box, the missile it launches, the, the sort of the incidental reference in film, but perhaps that points to a way of trying to think through biblical reception in culture that doesn't stack up specimens within a neat box of politics or music or film, but that tries to trace the subterranean connections that run in culture between various different bits. And I think it's the difference between imagining the Bible as an object in culture and, to sort of bastardise a quote of Alain Sixous, which I know Hugh has used in print, the idea of the Bible having the same dubious light in culture that bathes the subconscious. And so the question of whether the biblical is actually the subconscious of some of these things, rather than something necessarily that should be collected, standardised and categorised, because there are some of these subterranean connections here in politics um, and the arms trade and film, but elsewhere too, where there's, there's a sort of fungal network underground of biblical reception that our, our collectionist impulse in the Guild perhaps occludes. Thank you. <clears throat>